Welcome to a little bit of London that is forever Jaipur. Dear friends and lovers of literature, here we are again with JLF at the British Library 2021. It's a particular pleasure for me to come back to the British Library, which has been my office in London for many years, um, and uh, where uh, my books have all been written and researched. And it's very nice to see this end of, uh, of my life sort of double back on it. Our amazing writers, Today, more than any time, because of the way the digital age has taken over, we need you to be able to make sense of the past, divine the future, and perhaps set in context what we're going through at this very point of time. Do you feel that Britain and India can best intersect culturally? Well, we've been intersecting for a long time. It's not that we will have to intersect. If you look at our cultural and historical relations, we go back a long way. That may be nations or cultures or religions or sexualities, class, culture, um, gender, race, all those things, that that distance is somehow reduced or bridged because we're connecting at a very basic human level. I believe in the ability to, con the ability to convey meaning by the written word is, is our superpower. Counting the days till you guys get here. Hey, you're enjoying your English breakfast. What about unpacking? And did you open the bank account? I did that at the airport in India itself. How? Simple. With ICICI Bank's UKI mobile app, you can open your current account and transfer money to your loved ones in India instantly. And the NRI account? The ICICI Bank UK representative came home with a tab and opened my NRI account. Why don't you open your account right away through the UKI mobile app? You'll get the UK debit card in India itself. ICICI Bank UK iMobile app मतलब परदेश में भी अपना बैंक। On behalf of festival co-directors Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple and festival producer Sanjay Roy, we welcome you to the 2021 edition of JLF London at the British Library Virtual Festival. We are now delighted to present A Rude Life, Veer Sangvi, in conversation with Namita Bandare. The session is presented in partnership with ICICI Bank, United Kingdom. A delicious mix of politics, glamour, food, and all things rude. Columnist, writer, and journalist Veer Sangvi's memoir, A Rude Life, takes us on a compelling journey through his formative years, his time in Oxford, movie and political journalism, television and magazines, and the unforgettable characters he'd met along the way. Turning his dispassionate gaze upon himself, Veer Sangvi evaluates the experiences and challenges that have formed one of the most eventful careers in Indian journalism. In conversation with award-winning journalist Namita Bandare, Veer Sangvi looks into the personal and the political as well as the world of film and glamour while providing a glimpse into some of his biggest stories. Veer Sangvi is a veteran journalist. His television career has included several award-winning shows on the Star TV network, NDTV, Discovery, and other channels. He has a parallel career as India's leading food and travel writer. Namita Bhandare is a journalist with close to 30 years of experience in publications such as Sunday Magazine, India Today, and Hindustan Times. She is one of the founding editors of Article 14, a news website. In 2014, she was appointed India's first gender editor for the Mint newspaper, a post she held for three years. She continues to work as an independent journalist who writes primarily on gender issues. Ladies and gentlemen, you can access our sessions at london.jlflitfest.org. All our sessions will be available to view on our Facebook JLF Lit Fest page and on our YouTube channel, Jepo Lit Fest JLF. Please feel free to ask questions 
um, to our speakers by typing it into the comment section. Help JLF London bring more quality content to you in these uncertain times and strengthen the community by donating to the link provided. Our podcast partner for the session is Launchora. Ladies and gentlemen, a rude life. Veer Sangvi in conversation with Namita Bandare. This session is presented in partnership with ICICI Bank, United Kingdom. Over to you, Namita. Thank you so much, Ankur. Um, and hi, Veer. Congratulations on the spectacular success of your book, uh, A Rude Life. I have it here, published last month and already a bestseller. Well done. And I've read it, I can't tell you how many times already, uh, once just for fun, once to prepare for this. And it's always fresh. Uh, so really, uh, congratulations. I did have... I did wonder the first time I saw the subtitle, a memoir, and I said, Veer's too young to be writing a memoir. Memoirs are usually written by people who are well into their retirement. So what led to this book? Well, two answers to that question, Namita. Thank you for asking it. First of all, I am not too young to be writing a memoir. I'm 65. I'm sort of old, decrepit. My joints creak when I move. So it's probably the right time to do a memoir. And secondly, what led to writing it? Well, I had always said, you know me well, so you will know. I'd always said I would never ever do an autobiography or a memoir or anything like that. And then this damn lockdown happened. And I, the first lockdown, the Modi lockdown, when we were all locked at home, nothing was open. You couldn't get food delivery. You couldn't go to a shop. You couldn't do anything anything. There was no Zoom in those days. And I just got so frustrated and so bored at home that this seemed to be like the only thing I could do. So I did a few chapters think, thinking, let's see if the memories are coming back. And I think there's nothing quite like idleness to get the memory going. And it all came flowing back. And I just sat and wrote it in what, three months. Amazing. And did you ever keep notes I mean, was this all from memory or did you have? Notes? It was all from memory in some cases, like the early stuff is completely from memory, but say stuff about the HD or more recent, you could go back on the internet, you could look it up, you could find things. But a lot of the stuff, there was no internet. And as you know, a lot of the work we did at Sunday went up in smoke when the ABP library burned down. So a lot of it was sort of reconstructing from memory, which is why I think details may well be wrong. Okay, so I, I, I kind of hesitate to ask my next question, which is have yeah. you learned to type? No, I have a secretary a man who writes the book and should get a co-author credit, but I still write everything in longhand. I used to dictate it one time, as you know, but I think I can't even do that any longer. I write it all by longhand. My secretary types it. It then comes back to me and then I can correct on a phone or a keyboard. That's not a problem. So I do make changes, add paras, correct. But the original stuff comes, uh, is done in longhand and comes to me already typed. Right. So I do have the advantage of, um, of knowing you for 30 years. Yes. And so that the question really is, uh, follows from my knowledge that you never typed. You just got kind of bounce into the office and rattle off your column. Uh, to whoever lucky person. I mean, I always considered myself lucky if I was the one typing it because you learned a lot uh, and the way you thought, you never revised, you never said, read that paragraph out to me. Or if you were on a flight or somewhere, you'd write longhand. So that hasn't changed in all these years. Has mm -hmm. it? I mean, I, I, I don't actually revise very much or whatever. Rarely will I scratch out something and do it again. Though now, with the advantage of keyboards, when you edit your copy, it's mm -hmm. always possible to improve it much more than was possible in the old days. And so I think as a consequence, my writing has got better because I do, I'm forced to revise. And I have this problem, which you know, which is that when I look at anything I've written, especially when it's in print, I almost always hate it. I always say this is really badly written. I've repeated this phrase three times. I should have done that. So it gives me some opportunity with the keyboard to try and iron out some of those mistakes. Right. So the book is roughly divided into two sections. There is the personal, and I would say deeply personal, because there was a lot in it that I did not know. And then, of course, there is the political, which gives your readers a ringside view of clearly what were some of the most dramatic decades. Now, you've spoken about the, the politics of that time. Let's speak a little on the personal aspect, because you've been somewhat more reticent about it. 
um, you know, you had a, an unusual childhood, to say the least. You know, you were an adult at 15, admitted yourself. You know, can you talk a little bit about that and the loss of your father and the death of your father when you were so young and what that meant? Yeah, sure. My parents had a long and complicated love story, which I won't go into. But by the time I was born, they were comfortably middle class as far as I was concerned. And then around 64, 65, my father went abroad, made contacts, made quite a lot of money. And in 1966, when I was nine years old, he shifted to London and he had a flat in London. We kept the flat in Bombay and I would, I was at boarding school. So I would go there for my summer holidays and he'd made a lot of money. I mean, not business type money, but professional money. He was earning a good living. So we lived in quite great style. Everybody traveled first class. There was no sense in which we missed anything at that stage. Carnaby Street was like the place for children to go for guys, trendy people to go and buy clothes. And I, I used to go and buy my clothes there. And I really felt on top of the world. And then when I was 15 in 1971, I got a call when I was at boarding school to say that my father had shown this. And could I come to London? And at one level, it seemed easy enough. He'd shown this. What's the big deal? On the other hand, why would they call me to London? So I went. I took the flight on my own. I went there and I was actually quite worried when I got there. And they did an operation the day I got there. He, he, he was okay. He was reading in newspapers, chatting to me. And after the operation, they discovered in those days, in those primitive days, that was the only way of finding out. They discovered that he had a tumor, I think, the size of a man's fist on his liver, which in those were man's fist may be an exaggeration, a very large tumor, which in those days was the kiss of death. So the doctor said he was a goner. His family did not accept this because he had brothers and sisters who were doctors. We shifted him to New York. We spent quite a lot of time trying to help, but nothing really worked. I mean, often I think in retrospect, it's better when people are in that situation to just let them die in their own beds peacefully. But we put him through hell with more operations, tubes all over him. So I went to London to see him in around April. By July, he was dead. So it was quite sudden. And we discovered also, at least my mother discovered, that in that very expensive period of treatment, they'd spent most of the money that he'd been counting on. And he'd worked, he was about 50, 51. So he'd count on the fact that he'd worked for another 10, 15 years. So he hadn't really put much money away for a rainy day. So effectively, we were broke as far as living abroad was concerned. We had money in India because my mother came from a rich family. So we had a nice flat to live on and we had some kind of fixed income. So we weren't exactly on the streets, but it was in terms of affluence and opportunity and privilege, a huge wake up call because many of the things that I've taken for granted till then, for instance, my father had said, I'll send you to Sunset School, you'll go to Cambridge and everything will be organized. All that was out of the window. And my mother, I think, fell to pieces. She really couldn't cope. I was an only child. So I ended up having to look after her rather than the other way around, which was fine. I didn't mind that. She'd suffered a great and grievous loss. But it did mean that I did have to bring myself up. And as you say, I found a school in London, got myself admitted. Amazing. Did that leave some kind of insecurity? I mean, you were 15 or 16 and you were looking after your mother. You were the parent. So, you know, and you talk, you come back to that in your last chapter, you know, when you talk about sons who lose their fathers, you mentioned Jyotira Ditya Sindhya, you mentioned Naveen Patnaik, and you talk about that impact. So, you know, with, with, the, with, with hindsight, what do you think that did to you? I think that was probably the single most, if you can hear more than one, but the most defining event of my life, pretty much everything that's followed, you can trace back to that loss. I got to understand what loss means, which is difficult. I got to understand what being responsible for yourself means because there was nobody else really to look after me in that sense. I realized that things like money, privilege, which seemed easily available at one stage, could disappear one day. I realized that the people you love can suddenly vanish without any warning in a way that you don't understand. So I think that's 
contributed to a fundamental sense of insecurity within me. I often stay on in jobs longer than I should because I'm scared of what lies afterwards. I often hold on to people in relationships longer than I should because I have a sense of loss. I tend in many ways because I didn't have a father when there are younger people, I tend perhaps even when they don't want it to be much more mentoring or looking after them because I know what's that like. So almost everything you can trace back to that. Yeah, I understand. And I do understand, take what you mean uh, by mentoring. Yeah. Uh, you do mention in your book, you say, I had got into journalism by accident mm -hmm. because I had been fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. Um, I actually can't imagine you doing anything else, though to describe you as just a journalist is kind of limiting because you've worn so many hats. You've been a print journalist, you've been a television journalist, you write on politics, you write on food and lifestyle. And I think in your mind, you don't create a hierarchy, you know, the way most journalists do that political writing is at the acme and lifestyle writing is somehow a lesser form of journalism. Could you have done anything else apart from journalism? I don't know. I mean, as I say in the book, when they asked me at university, what would I like to be? I said, partly as a joke, I was very into music at that time, that I'd like to join the music business because I'm really into rock. And they gave me that opportunity to the credit of my dons at Oxford. And I turned it down. Now, I don't know whether I turned it down because I was already comfortably placed in journalism, because when I finished Oxford, I went back to Bombay and I became editor of Bombay magazine. Effectively, my first full-time job as a journalist was as an editor, and that seemed comfortable in a way. So maybe it was that rather than the fear of the unknown of ending up in a music company in Los Angeles, talking to cocaine, strung out rock artists and trying to make a success of it. Maybe it was a fear of the unknown, but I reckon I could have done the music business. I had intended at one stage to become a lawyer. And with many people who do PPE, which is the course I did at Oxford, then go on to do law in London. But in my case, A, we didn't really have the money for me to do that, to stay on in London. And B, you had a choice between being a, being a journalist in a job that was waiting for you and you were starting at the top in a manner of speaking or staying on as a student. So I took the path of least resistance. Correct. And then, of course, you, you write again that you were an editor during a period that you describe as boom time for journalism. So what made it such an exciting time? Well, it was an odd time for India because... We'd have the newspapers, the newspapers are still around, the Times of India, the Hindustan Times, the Hindu, the Statesman, the Moral is just about still around. And most of these newspapers were not very good. They were edited exactly the same way as been edited about 20 years before. There was a huge distinction, which I never understood, between the assistant editors who we would now call leader writers, people who sat in cabins and wrote editorials, mm -hmm. and the guys who actually went and produced the newspaper. Paper. And the leader writers had to come from Oxford or Cambridge. And I was offered a job as an assistant editor on the Economic Times and the Times of India, merely by virtue of having gone to Oxford. And I found that whole newspaper system bizarre, and I thought it couldn't last. There was a very famous story, probably not true, about Shamlal, who was a legendary editor of the Times of India going to a party and hearing somebody discuss what was happening. And he said to the man, he said, you seem very well informed, sir. And I said, thank you, sir. And he said, what do you do? He said, sir, you don't know me, but I'm your chief reporter. Now, I don't know if the story is true or not, but it could well have been true. That was the kind of distinction there was between editors and what happened in newspapers in those days. So I always thought newspapers were not an attractive proposition. But what happened after the emergency particularly was because the press was suddenly free, having been silenced by Indira Gandhi, and because people hadn't heard of what's happened, had happened during the emergency because of censorship, there was an outpouring of interest and content to do with the emergency. Some people called it political porn. Maybe, maybe it was, or maybe it wasn't. But this led to a magazine boom. Magazines were on the whole not produced by people from the traditional newspaper industry. Many of the people who produced magazines, Nari Hira, who produced Stardust, which is incredibly influential, came from advertising. Ashok Advani, he produced Business India, which is incredibly influential also, and created business journalism, was a lawyer. And most famously, Arun Puri was an accountant who was running, his, who was running a printing press. 
and was forced into becoming an editor. So these were people who had none of those preconceived notions. They hired young people. They did things that weren't done before. They didn't benchmark themselves against Indian journalists. They benchmarked themselves globally. I remember in India today, we were always benchmarking against Time magazine. So anybody who was fortunate to be around during that period and could therefore get a job was in during the boom. That's right. You mentioned the emergency and of course um, there was LK Advani's very famous statement about the media, uh, you know, when asked to bend, it chose to crawl. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people draw comparisons between that time and now. Do you? Yeah, sometimes when you see the way journalism going, you begin to wonder if the media was always meant to be a four-legged beast because people seem much more comfortable crawling than they are standing on their own feet. There's not even a question of bending. You could argue during the emergency that people who wrote against the government went to jail and there was some element of penal uh, penalty if you did something, but not now. People do it just to keep in with the powers that be. People are willing to carry stories that they know are untrue. They're willing to attack other people only at the behest of the powers that be. It's, I think, the emergency you can't count because it wasn't our fault. But this, I think, surely is the lowest spot for Indian journalism in our history. The lowest spot in the history of our, um, in, in the history of our journalism. Can you elaborate? Yeah, sure. I think there was a sense earlier that if you ran a story, you tried to get the other side, that you tried to make sure you could substantiate what you were writing. This is not unusual. I mean, everybody does it everywhere else in the world. In India, there is no need to do that. Stories appear that are one-sided, that are not based on fact. It's even worse. In print media, to some extent, has retained its standards. It's even worse in the case of television, where rumors planted stories are passed off as news, where anchors believe that their business is to put their own views out there, not bothering about whether those views are accurate. They vilify people, they crucify them, they don't even look for facts. Sometimes, unfortunately, it works in terms of ratings. So people like Rhea Chakraborty, I mean, the vilification, the crucifixion of Rhea Chakraborty is, I think, a case study of everything that's wrong with the Indian media. Correct. And in this, you would you can't really blame the politics of the time. I mean, would you, you know, is, is it the anchors? You know, where, where does this come from? Once you, what's the slippery slope? Once, in order to please the powers who matter, you decide you're not going to worry about facts. You're going to keep saying whatever you want, regardless whether it's true or not. Then when it comes to, say, the Sushant Singh Rajput death, do you suddenly use different standards? You don't. So once your standards have collapsed, that affects everything you do. So I do believe that it starts at the head from politics and then goes across the whole body. But do you think that, uh, that politicians are actually reading newspapers, watching TV channels and saying, this article was not fair to me, this cannot be carried? I, mean, I work <laughs> in a television channel during this period. And I know for a fact that after each discussion, they would get calls saying that the BJP spokesperson was cut off. You're clearly biased. The BJP spokesperson had four minutes of airtime. The Congress person had six times. So yeah, they're watching and they're watching very carefully. Right. I sometimes I look at the, you know, because you mentioned Time magazine, I look at the US press during the Trump years. And the US media, whether it was New Yorker, New York Times, Washington Post, they just remained resolutely against Trump. And we just kind of fell in so easily. You kind of wonder if there is a, there is a structural problem in our media where perhaps proprietors wield more influence than editors. Yeah, but you know, even let's take examples from the American press. The Pentagon Papers was the New York Times and then the Post. Watergate was the Washington Post. In every case, it went up to the proprietor. In every case, the proprietor knew that the publication might close down or suffer very grievous harm if the publication of the story went ahead. And yet, in every case, they said, never mind, damn it, publish me, damn, we'll take the risk. I don't think our proprietors are that brave. 
So why not? Because if you look at, I mean, we're not naming names, but we, I am, I am naming names. You look at a group like the Times of India, it's a hugely influential group, which is there in newspapers. It's there in, uh, you know, they have a business paper. They are there in the language press. They have a television channel. So a publication like that can say, I have the clout to stand up to you. Yeah. Why don't yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll answer that because, I mean, to be fair to any publishing house, there are also standards incorporated into the American system. The Internal Revenue Service will not come and raid you tomorrow and freeze your accounts without any provocation. Even if that should happen, you can go to a judge. You can have some redress. Can you in India? I don't think government agencies necessarily need a genuine reason to harass people. And as we've seen, the courts may respond, but it takes a very long time before you get a response. That's right. The courts may not always respond on the side of freedom of the press it's because in, we're institutionally weak. I mean, we've got... Let's take the example of the comedian in Bhopal, Faruqi, who yeah. was arrested for a joke he did not make. I mean, first of all, he should never have been arrested. And the moment it went to any court, he should have been released. He stayed in jail till it went to the Supreme Court, which finally ordered his release. I mean, what? how's that for freedom of the press? Well, look at this, the arrested. students, the students who are in jail for protesting. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so um, you do talk a little bit about the Modi years, um, you know, mm -hmm. and you talk about him you compare this with an earlier Modi who you used to know who was relaxed, jovial, convivial. What happened? And you know, what is Modi's relationship with the press? I, you know, I really don't know. One reason people ask me why isn't there more about Modi in the book? Well, one reason for that is that this is not a history of India, it's a memoir. So I've written about the Modi I knew. This Modi, I don't know. I have never met him since he became prime minister. I see him on television like everybody else sees him. When he was chief minister of Gujarat, I saw him a couple of times and he'd begun to change. So even then he was good with crowds. He was doing his best to be likable, to seem reasonable. I think he doesn't feel any need to do that any longer. He's changed. He's become a somewhat Olympian figure who's not, I don't think he has very many equal relationships. He seems neither of the left, neither of the right, as they used to say about De Gaulle, but above. He seems like that kind of character. Maybe it's what power does to people. I don't know. So you've, you've met and interviewed very many prime ministers hmm. and powerful people. But I don't think we've ever had a prime minister who has never given an unscripted you know, press conference, who's never addressed an unscripted press conference ever. You know, when he gives interviews, it is to film actors, not to professional journalists. Um, I mean, that, that is unprecedented, isn't it? Yeah, I think he argues in his defense that earlier prime ministers of his predecessors had to use the media to get across to the country. He says he can do it directly through his monkey bath and through social media, through WhatsApp, through Facebook, and that the media landscape has changed. And we now live in a multimedia world where the mainstream media, the people who used to get interviews are only a small part. And by getting across people directly using social media, he gets his message across much more effectively and he doesn't really need regular media. And you do write about that as a big mistake of the Congress party in the 2014 election, that the Congress party seemed oblivious about the reach of social media, whereas the BJP had already understood the potential yeah. of this. Yeah? yeah, I think that's one of the problems with being in power. You live in this bubble, you lose sight of what's going on in the outside world. And from 2004, when the Congress got elected, 10 years later, when it lost, India changed dramatically. When the Congress got elected in 2004, there was no Apple phone. There were no smartphones. By the time it lost power, everybody had a smartphone of some description, was getting internet on that smartphone. And I think just pass them all by. And some countries it matters, some countries it didn't. You remember at the HT summit, Tony Blair spoke about the things he'd missed out on when he was prime minister. And during the time he was prime minister, he said he'd never ever used a mobile phone because that revolution happened while he was at Downing Street. And then he gave up being prime minister and they gave him a mobile phone. And he was amazed to see that when people called him, their names could appear on the mobile phone. So he was very excited. 
And then he called people and they would reply or message people and they would reply saying, who is this? And you say, you mean just because I'm not prime minister, you had to explain to them that you have to enter the numbers, etc. So I think something like that happened to the Congress, but on a much more massive scale. And it's odd because the Congress was comprised of educated people. All the guys who surrounded Rahul Gandhi had all gone to universities in America. They all came back. They bought great gadgets. They seemed like smart young dudes. Yet none of them understood that social media had penetrated to every village in India, that it was possible through Facebook and WhatsApp to get across your message without going through the usual channels. They were completely thrown by all of this. Understood. And, and missed out. Do you think they've caught up now? Have they woken up to the power? Not and really. The I mean, yeah. Opinions vary, but I think one of the dangers of being a sort of journalist or a politician in Delhi is you think that the world revolves around Twitter. And therefore, if you have like the BJP as an IT cell, which says terrible things to all of us on Twitter. But the Congress now has, I don't know if it's an IT cell, the Congress doesn't have that kind of money. But the Congress has a hard core of cult followers who will attack and abuse anyone who suggests that Rahul Gandhi was not born in a manger when the star of Bethlehem blazed, blazed in the sky. And it's vicious abuse of all kinds. And they believe, I think, that they're doing themselves a favor. They're not because most of the people they attack are liberals because liberals are very concerned about the state of the country, are very concerned about the failure of the Congress to address it. So if you keep abusing them and calling them Modi bhaks and stuff like that, you lose even the one constituency that the Congress had that might have been sympathetic to it. EJP operates through WhatsApp and through Facebook. And there the Congress is pathetic. Understood. But we live in these times where everything is so polarized. So you're either with me or without me, you know, and, and that's a problem. I mean, ARP, you know, does it very well. If there's, if there's any criticism about Kejriwal, they, they will come down on you like a ton of bricks. And it's, you just, there is no middle stand. So, you know, when, when you write, when you do your political writing, I mean, how, how does that, because, you know, you know, how do you, does that weigh on you that you need to take a certain political line because otherwise you will be seen as less than liberal? No, not really. I mean, the last political piece I did that was widely read was for the NDTV website. It was following the sacking of Amarinder Singh as Punjab chief minister. And while I did not take a stand on whether he should have been sacked or not, that's the matter for the Congress and the MLAs to decide. I did describe how this would have happened 10 years ago and how it happens in the new Congress. I mean, the sum total of which was, I didn't think that Rahul and Priyanka had the instincts or even the legitimacy at the moment to make those decisions. And I was abused nonstop by Congress people who called me a Chandiwala, a RSS guy, a Modi lover, stuff like that, you sort of factor that in, you giggle a little and you move on. Correct. You've never also lived down, though you've, you've you know, convincingly proved that the radio tapes were doctored. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about that? Because no, I, I'm, I'm happy to I, mean, I bore everyone in every interview by talking no, about no, <laughs> Please do. No, because my, my question really was that there are some things that, you know, even when you have, when you demonstrate that this is false, but Every time you write something or because, you know, I follow you on Twitter and I see, oh, radio tapes, you know, somebody will just jump up and say, oh, radio tapes, you know, well, how no, do you, you look at people, To be fair, if I mean, I, I answer the radio tapes question, but if you look at the people who say radio tapes to me or to Barkhazaz or even to Venu, who was mentioned on those yeah. tapes, they are nearly always people from anonymous handles with 10 followers. It's a technique used by IT cells to try and shut us up, to say, hey, you're a radio journalist or whatever. I think fewer genuine people actually say that on Twitter. Right. So you were coming to the second part, how you do yeah, the second part. You said you wanted to talk about the radio tapes. Or whether yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I think in your answer, whether I've lived it down or the radio tapes were now what, 11 years ago? Exactly. I think there's a whole generation out as readers of people in social media who have a very dim recollection of what the radio tapes incident was about. And I think four or five years from now, there will be even less. I've discovered with this book, because I talk about the radio tapes at great length about how the government 
the CBI told the Supreme Court on three different occasions that the tapes had been doctored, that we had tests that proved that the tapes had been doctored, that Outlook, after a court case filed by me, withdrew the suggestions that it had made on its cover. I've told this to people, but people really don't remember. They don't have any context. And you have to sort of explain at tedious length what the controversy is about before you say, you know, therefore, I, I have to tell you that I, my name is unfairly dragged in. Barkha and I did a joint clubhouse thing, and she was also on it. And she had to spend so long explaining to people what it was about that I begin to wonder why we keep raising it. So you think it's just better to just... No, it's not. I mean, I was told when I wrote the book also, and in fact, when I sued out, look at that case dragged out for years, that whatever happens, you will not win because you will just keep the story alive. The exactly. story has been yeah. forgotten. Why are you doing it? But I have that old fashioned idea that if you're accused of something falsely, you must get an apology and establish the charges were false. So even though I probably helped keep the story alive, the resolution was very satisfying, satisfying for me. Correct. And well done uh, uh, fighting that good fight. Uh, you know, we these days you seem to be, you know, I, I mean, I don't know whether you see a future in journalism per se or in the kind of journalism you started out doing, because you're doing so many different things on parallel tracks, including you've become an entrepreneur. So congratulations for that. Also entrepreneur, yeah. Yeah. How do yeah. you see the future of journalism? Where do you see this going? I'm, I'm not optimistic about the future of journalism, but in answer to your question of why I'm doing so many different things, you must remember I became an editor when I was 22. I became editor of the Hindustan Times when I was in my mid forties. That in terms of conventional journalistic jobs, by the time I was 50, I had done pretty much everything you could do. There was no place further on the greasy pole to go up. So what could I do? I could have hung on as many people do, do editorships and continued being an editor, et cetera. Or I could have done something that was more interesting, more entertaining. And my decision, maybe the right decision, wrong decision I write about in the book was determined by several factors. One of which was, I write about this phenomenon called editoritis in my book. People who are editors get used to the power it brings. They get used to the access. And when all editorships end one day, and when they finally end, they're desperate. They try and do other jobs that give them access. They join political parties. They try and become MPs. They try and become advisors to ministries or whatever. I never wanted to be in that situation, which is one reason I walked away from being an editor. But in answer to your question, that if you've done all these things, if you've been an editor, if you've anchored a television show, etc., what do you do afterwards? And there are people who've been young editors in India, and the usual answer of people who be editors young is that they go into politics, they sort of sacrifice their principles, maybe change parties, etc. No names, but that is pretty much one traditional role for people to follow. I decided I wouldn't do that, that as long as I could keep body and soul together and make some kind of living, I'd rather do the things that I enjoy. I, one thing I don't enjoy any longer is managing large teams of people. You've known me as an editor, two different publications, which involved a lot of managing people, making up for other people's mistakes, taking a responsibility, which I found exhausting. So as long as I can do things that entertain me, don't involve other people and still help me make a living, I'll do them. So I've done television at the moment, I'm a bit of a break, but I assume I will do some more television in the coming days. I do a fair amount of internet stuff. I write a column for the HD website. I write regularly for the NDTV website. I do the food column for the HD. I am a partner, as you said, on e in Easy Diner. I'm chairman of an outfit called Culinary Culture, which will do ratings on, Michel on the Michelin pattern mm -hmm. for Indian restaurants and give awards to chefs. Now, you're right. A lot of these things don't have very much in common, but I don't really want to be typed. I just want to do various things I can, if I can do them and I can enjoy them. Great. Well, thank you very much, Veer. I, I am not done with you yet, but okay. I did get a bit nostalgic there when you spoke about managing the large team. And I remember uh, one of our meetings in Hindustan Times where you said, you know, I am here, you can fire from my shoulder and you protected us. So we had the freedom back then to write what we wanted. And I, I want to thank you for that. 
I'm going to channel my inner Karan Johar. I'm sure you didn't know I had one. I'm going to do a rapid fire. And I have to tell you, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a hamper. It's, 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 not, it's not a bad rapid fire. It's an easy one. The most charismatic person you've ever interviewed. The Dalai Lama. Okay. The biggest bore you've ever interviewed. Too many to mention. Generally, I have to say, because I did a lot of interviews with business people, which for the when we launched the HT in Bombay, which we collected in a book called Men of Steel. The book was a huge bestseller, but I was so bored interviewing them. They're the biggest bores. But you have you not named one. You have to name the biggest board. Come on, Veer. The biggest one interview. No, it's very unkind to tell say that what's the biggest board. <laughs> I will not do that. Okay, fine. One person you look up to. I look up to a living person? Yeah, living. I look or up a to... dead. It could be anyone. Person you really I look, look up, up to. to lots of people in the profession. I look up to many people who are alive for what they've achieved. I look up to Nainan, who I think is the best newspaper editor we've had for a long time. I look up to Barkha, who I think is a great television reporter and a great reporter. I look up to Shekhar, who I think is a fantastic columnist. So I have many, many people in this in this profession who I think very highly of. Okay. Uh, your biggest regret... Roy, Roy, who invented oh, Indian television, yes. is a hero. Yeah, you've actually I found it um, a little strange because Abhik Sarkar you kind of treat in this very jokey manner, but there's a great deal of affection that comes through. Yeah, but Abhik, my relationship with Abhik Sarkar was different. It was the relationship of great affection. It was yes. sort of older that brother, younger, older brother, younger brother relationship. Correct. Your biggest regret? None. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of screw ups in my life, but I don't look back. Okay. I don't say I wish I had done this or I wish I had done that. I mean, there are obvious missteps. I should never have joined NewsX, for example, stuff like that. But no, I don't regret it. Okay. And a superpower you wish you had? Invisibility. Okay. <laughs> I don't particularly like being I like Okay. I'm being cued. I'm, I'm told that there are five minutes to the end of the session and we've got questions which I've been ignoring. So okay. Kim asks... Is there material in a rude life that's being published for the first time? And does it include off the record conversations? A lot of material is being published for the first time. Namita Bandare, who's known me for 30 years in answer to your question, Kim, didn't know a lot of what was in the book. So a lot of it is being published for the first time. The rule on off the record and on the record is as follows. If I have a chat with Narasimha Rao and he tells me something because it's just a chat and 30 years later or 40 years later, I put it into a book, that's fine. If Narasimha Rao tells me something in confidence and says, please, you must never ever mention it to somebody, it doesn't go into the book. Correct. Ria asks, but actually that's a question you've answered, but I'll ask it anyway. You've seen the media through generations. Do you think it can save itself? Ria, if you just recall, we just spoke about that a bit. Um, Aruna asks, if you get the opportunity to interview the Prime Minister, I believe Prime Minister Modi, then what three questions would you ask him? Oh, that's easy enough. One, do you actually believe all the stuff you say about inclusive uh, India? Because the way in which India is going, it doesn't appear to be there. Two, you've changed. What made you change? Was it as your fo camp followers say, because the media attacked you on the Gujarat riots? And three, you've said that people must retire at the age of 1975. You pushed Mr. Advani. Uh, so, what am I saying? The age of 75, you pushed Mr. Advani, Dr. Joshi off the stage. You're going to be 75 soon. Will you retire? <laughs> okay, I do hope you get that chance to ask that question. I hope he, uh, or one of his minders, uh, at least passes the message on. It's Jared. Actually, yeah. very unlikely, Namata, but thank you for the wish. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jared is asking there is not much mention of food in your book. Was yeah, that a conscious choice? Yeah, because I mean, uh, food is a nice thing to write about. I enjoy it, etc. But in terms of my memories, in terms of my life, if I was to write down the things that mattered most in my life, the fact that I became editor of the Hindustan Times, or that my father died, or that I was there to cover the fall of a government, probably matters more than the last good culture I had. Correct. Correct. Have you started book, your next book? 
yeah i started it and then i abandoned it and then i i must go back to it but that is a for you know that book that is a food book well it okay. it relies on the cooperation of my wife who's now written her own novel and therefore no longer seems interested in the book the idea was we take 12 dishes that i liked that i liked from my childhood i'd research them we write about their development we talk about many anecdotes to do with each one many versions and at the end and this was seema's part we would try various recipes we perfect one and we'd put that in the at the end of the book so it was not just a fun book about food say so let's stick stick with the culture we uh, use that as an example but it was also of some use to people whether we could do things my wife now seems to have no interest in it so it depends on how it goes. okay i can see ankur has popped up and i think we're uh, cleared out of time there are a lot of questions that are coming in um ankur i'm not sure if people can send questions in when the session is over i'm really really sorry thank you veer it's always a can pleasure. i say one thing namita yes please yes i've done a lot of interviews as you well know for this book i can't think of one i've enjoyed more so thank you so much <laughs> thank you that is so kind of you veer thank you so much it's always uh, a pleasure to talk to you because i learn so much so much more